the pattern of the provision of the covenants. I cover this at length. Links will be in the video description. I covered it at length in the Preterism series, um, episode 8 out of 12, episode 8 slash 12. Has the links in it also. About what are the differences between the covenants? When you look at all of the covenants, you see a progression along the same, what do you want to call it? Kind of like factory lines. All right, there are the same questions, because of relationship questions, that apply to every group in the human race, but the method of addressing those questions changes. And here's what I mean. Let's say you and somebody else, you're friends with somebody else. You have a certain way of relating to each other. There is an outer way that you relate to each other and there's an inner way you relate to each other. Your outer way of relating to each other might be by letter because you're separated by a distance. Okay? So you write to each other. Now, in the old days, if you wrote somebody a letter, you would have to get something, some writing instrument. You would have to have some medium on which to write. You would be writing in a language the other person could understand. And depending on how difficult it was to do all those things, your letter would be short or long, frequent or infrequent. Now think about that. You knew somebody in the past who you're now distant from, and you're writing them a letter. In Roman times, you would have to get this pressed papyrus, which was really kind of expensive. It got cheaper over time. You would buy it in huge sheets, and every time you wrote a letter, you'd cut off some. And then they would get the letter, and because it was expensive, they'd read the letter, memorize it, if it was you know, important or they wanted, they cared about it. Then they would wash those sheets and use it to write you back. So there was this huge time gap between the time you wrote the letter and the time they got the letter and the time they replied. Therefore, the relationship between you and the other person at a distance is kind of hampered by all those physicalities, all those logistics. Versus being together every single day instead of having to write a letter, you just talk to each other. Now obviously the content of the communication, the amount of the communication is going to be, you know, oodles bigger on a lot more topics if you're right next to each other all the time versus being at a distance. Now again, there's another element that comes into play when the technology changes. Today, somebody can be anywhere in the world and I can write and they can write back 16 emails a day or more. So a whole lot of communication can be had between two people very far apart. But it is still less than the amount of communication that's available if the two people are physically next to each other all the time. But it's a whole lot more than in the old days. So you're looking at two kinds of differences. <clears throat> the difference of being apart and the difference of the technology that goes with being apart. How much does it hamper communication? Versus being together all the time. I mean intimately together, you know, all the time. 
And of course, you know, you've got radiations in between. The, in terms of the content and the amount of communication, there's a great deal more if the technology is higher. So it can be done more and faster. Which creates a kind of substitute for the lack of physical proximity. But physical proximity is number one. Now I'm leaving out the disadvantages that go with close, constant physical proximity because they're significant. But in terms of the relationship being able to quickly get very deep, very fast, it's all measured by how much communication is between the two parties. On how many levels, on how many topics, okay? Which is aided by proximity and except for t possible technology advance, is detracted from by means of distance. Okay? You got that. And I'm just talking about physical distance or physical proximity. Everything else is presumed to be non-glitchy. Okay, but that brings up the next point. There are glitches even when you're constantly together if you're not speaking the same language if you only speak English and couldn't understand Spanish to save your life and the person you're constantly around speaks only Spanish you're going to be using a lot of sign language there's going to be a lot of miscommunication, misunderstanding and that's going to discourage you to from trying to communicate with each other unless there's something between you that really compels you to try to do that, which means that you're each going to learn the other one's language as much as you can. But that's still going to put a delay on the closeness in the relationship because they're two languages. And one party at least doesn't understand the other one's language. You see that. So physical proximity isn't alone going to solve the problem of closeness between two people. They have to speak the same language. On top of that, even if they do speak the same language, they have to think enough the same in order to communicate and share. Okay? If everything I like you hate, if all my, I don't know, philosophies, ways of thinking, reasoning, are the opposite of yours, inimical, then the communication between us is going to be strained and in order to prevent or reduce the amount of pain that occurs during the communication we're going to communicate less especially if we're around each other all the time and we're going to seek ways not to be around each other all the time you got those parameters okay so the whole thing, in order to understand the covenants, you got to understand these fundamentals about communication. They're first governed by whether you want to be together. So that last thing I mentioned about how much you think like the other person and they think like you, that's going to have a huge impact on how much you want to be around that person. If you don't share the same ideas, values, thought patterns, to at least a little bit, that amount that you that you share is going to form the basis for how much communication you have. To the extent you don't share, it's going to reduce the amount of communication you have. You got that. Because this, this is the underlying thing about covenants. It has to do with communication difference. There's one final thing that is related. One of the differences that occurs between two people in their thinking process is that one person is a lot younger than the other. Now, I don't mean physically younger, although that, that often goes with it. I mean the thought process is undeveloped versus the other person. 
okay, you have a certain amount of communication with your dog. But it's pretty limited, really. You love your dog. Your dog loves you, but your communication is real limited. And you make the most of it, but it's real limited. You have more communication with your baby who might you know, your child who might be a baby. But it's still pretty limited. Because the baby just doesn't understand. And as the baby grows, you're trying to teach the baby. So the kind of relationship you have is superior to inferior. And you're trying to teach the baby. You don't you know the baby's inferior, but that doesn't you're not upset about that. You're trying to raise the baby. You don't want him to be inferior, you want him to grow and be happy. But your communication's really limited. At the older the baby gets, the more communication, but it's still limited. The most communication would be had between a husband and a wife, who ideally think a lot alike, that's why they got married. So that it's okay to have all these other divergences in communication, because the husband and wife are thinking so much alike. They can share their ups and downs together, and they want to. When you really love somebody, you want to share the good times, but you also want to share the bad times, just because it's with that person. Anything. Good, bad, up, down, anything. It's that person you want to share it all. That's why people get married, ideally. And that's where happy marriages are. That's how they think about each other. Even if they don't agree with each other on everything. It's that person, that's what that person thinks. This is my wife, this is my husband. Whatever my husband is, whatever my wife is, I want. Even if I don't like it. Because you buy into the whole person. Lock, stock, and barrel. So as you can see, there's a wide variety of communication issues, restrictions, problems, and they all end up governing how intimate... Two parties in a relationship can be with each other. Some of the restrictions have to do with time differences, with delays, with technology problems, with you know distance. Other problems have to do with differences still, but you know volitional differences, how two people look at things, and some of the differences have to do with values that aren't shared that are due to one party not being able to even understand. You got that. So now we enter into the whole concept of covenants. And I cover this at length. The link will be in the video description starting in Lord v. Satan 2. Covenants are covenants of association. God deeds are all built, are all designed for enjoyment, for fellowship, for intimacy with God. They are covenants of association. We childishly consider covenants to be somehow a vindication or a diagnosis of I'm a good girl or, or a bad girl, good boy or bad boy. That's not what they're there for. That's part of the cost of doing business. But that's not what they're there for. When two people get married, they marry for better or for worse. And there are issues of better and worse in the marriage. But they're doing it because they want to be with each other for better and for worse. God has married us for better and for worse. But do we marry him? That's where these covenants come in. When you... Believe in Christ, you're under a covenant of association. Because it's a learning, it's a, a sort of training manual. Hi, you want to have a relationship? Well, what does that mean? How do I relate to God? I can't see. You see? You need to have some kind of system. That will teach you how to know God because you can't see him. And we see each other and we still form all these rules too. 
We're always forming customs and traditions and relationship roles and rules in our relationships with each other, sometimes ad hoc, sometimes formally. Because it just sort of facilitates our way to think about how to relate to each other. We'd like to have some kind of organization and system. And it does work if we pick the right system. I mean, pretty much in every culture of the world, although some cultures are worse than others, the husband doesn't beat the wife because he really just kind of wants to have a good relationship with her. And you can't really have that if you beat your spouse. Of course, in some cultures, they encourage you to beat your wife. And some wives think they ought to be beaten. That's kind of stupid. If you're marrying somebody, you're not marrying them to beat them up. You're marrying them to share life with them. You can beat up on a dog if you want. I don't recommend that either. Can't have a good relationship with a dog if you beat him up. So you establish little rules like don't beat up your wife. Limit your arguing. Try to work it out. You see, that's a natural outflow of relationship. If I have a relationship to you, I need to know what you like, you dislike, how you think, what you don't, you know, how you don't think. Just because I want to know you. But also so that I know how to relate to you. And vice versa. Okay, well, the same thing applies with God. These are covenants of association. How do you relate to God? How's God going to relate to you? So you know Him. The objective of these covenants is to know God through the rules. You use the rules to know the person. That's always been true, will always be true. That's why what we do in our daily lives with everybody. Okay, so you're set on that. We got communication problems and issues that, that will affect drastically how intimate you can be with somebody. And at the same time, we need and want rules of association with each other to facilitate the relationships that we want. Okay. So now, let's go back because this is all in trial perspective now. We go all the way back to the angels. Like I said, you, I did a huge write-up on this starting in Lord v. Satan 2. Because I had to write it all out to understand it. My pastor taught it for years, but it's like until, for me, I'm this kind of person, until I write it out or speak it out, I don't know what I know. I don't know what I learned. And maybe you're different. Maybe you don't have to do that. I'm retarded. I have to do that. Okay, so now let's go back. And like I said, it's all written up if you'd rather read it. The angels were the first creation, the first group that God made. He made them all at once. Bing. Here they are. They are fully... Uh, how do you want to call it? They got all these libraries in their head and all these abilities from the get-go. They're way higher than we are. Now, just because you got a lot of information in your head doesn't mean you know what it is. It doesn't say anything yet about what you think of that information. Do you prove it? Do you disapprove it? How do you relate one piece of information to another piece of information? In other words, you walk into a library and there's all these books around you. And even if you knew what was in all those books, what do you think of the, of the material? How does Catcher in the Rye relate to Samson and Delilah? How do you want it to relate to Samson and Delilah? What do you think of both stories? You know? So you got information about what you want to do with it. You got information about what do you think about it. What are the different relationships between the relationships between the information even. And then how do you use that in your body? How do you use that in your life with other beings who are just like you? Or a little different, but not so different. That you can communicate with them, intimately or not. That was the issue the angels faced. Their 
one second they're not there, the next second they're there, as if it were, so to speak, full adults, in terms of their ability to process information. They're not children with no ability to understand. But they're new. And the information in their head is new to them. So they got to play with it. It's like you woke up, you wake up tomorrow morning, and you start to get put your feet on the floor out of bed, and you notice this big green pile right underneath the window, and the window's open, but the wind isn't blowing. What's this green pile? Did somebody dump a lot of grass? And you get, you know, because you're sort of sleepy and you got muck in your eyes and you're clearing your eyes. And suddenly you look at it and it's like, oh no, it's a big pile of money. First thing in your head is, oh, did some robber just dump it out of the window? Is it stolen money? How did I get this money? And you, you know, in disbelief, you walk closer and you see it's a big pile of, I think they still make it, million dollar bills. I think there's still a denomination called a million dollars that's actually issued as a bill. Might not be that big anymore. I think I saw one once. Maybe I hallucinated it. But pretend that there really was such a denomination as a million dollar bill and you just see a pile of them right in front of your window. No wind blowing. No evidence of any struggle or forced entry. So you can't prove it's stolen money. And you put it in a bag, feeling very guilty and furtive. You wait for a couple of days. There's nothing in the news. You call the local police department. Say, well, has there been any reports of stolen money? I think I got some. And the policemen, of course, come over. They make a report. You tell them the story, and they say, well, we we have no claims of anybody wanting the property or of any missing property, so we can't actually confiscate this, but we would ask you to put it in escrow at Bank X, so you do, and it sits there in the bank. Your relationship to that money is potential. until you can be sure that it doesn't belong to anybody else because under the law of there's a sort of kind of kind of law that if you have something on your property and you find it and no one claims it it's yours turns out that it's you know 100 million dollars what do you do with all that money it's yours they finally clear it well you're the lucky owner of a million half you know 100 million dollars but Uncle Sam's going to come by and collect half of it. Okay, fine. You, you, it's 50 million you didn't have yesterday. Okay. What do you do with it? This is what the angels faced. One minute they don't exist. The next minute they exist. They got all this information in their head. And there's this person named God who made them. And as far as they're concerned, they're meeting him for the first time. They're meeting everything for the first time. They're meeting themselves for the first time. I mean, imagine what it was like the first day these angels exist. Huh? 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 Oh! 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 I can talk, but I don't know what I'm talking about. I can communicate, but I don't I don't actually understand all this stuff I know. I can spout it, but I don't understand it. What do I do with this? Of course, God's telling them. But day after day after day after day after day, they're finding out what all their new money is, what to do with it. And they're establishing, making decisions. They're establishing all kinds of rules. God's giving them rules. They're establishing rules on their own, based on the information in their head. Well, this is how we're going to relate to each other. They have different things and the same information they got. 
that they like. One angel likes it, the other angel doesn't like it so much. They're free to determine. And they're all rocking along for a certain amount of time. And establishing whatever rules there were. God made whatever rules there were so it could facilitate the relationships and the intimacy. And you have to argue that at the beginning, at the get-go, everything was, you know, maxed. They see him, he sees them, of course. They see each other. There are billions of them, as far as I know. They're picking who they're going to relate to, who they want to be close to, who they don't want to be so close to. I mean, none of that's sin. That's just free will. You like this person better than this other person. Why not? It's not a question of whether that person is better than the next one. You just like them better. I had a crack cup that I kept for 15 years. And I liked it better than all my other cups. I had 24 cups. Why? I don't know. I just kept collecting them. But I liked that one above all the rest of them. And it was actually uglier than the rest of them. And it had a crack that went from top to bottom. Why did I like that cup better? The other cups were superior. The other cups were better. I liked that one. Period. Was it a sin to like that one over the other ones? No. So angels kind of congregated into groups. Based on their mutual attractions to each other. Based on their shared ideas about the information that was in their head. Based on their perception and desire for whatever rules of interaction with God that they all had. That's inevitable. Free will means you're going to differentiate. Now over time... All this stuff was developing and moving along and they were knowing each other better and better each day, variantly, depending on how close they wanted to be with each other and God. And there was just this group who I don't know exactly how it worked, but there was this guy named Halal ben Shakar, And he was placed at the head. He walked among the stones of fire. That was a nickname for the angels. Ezekiel 28. Going back and forth. And he was like the gatekeeper for God. You wanted to see God. You wanted to talk to God. You went through this guy. And obviously, you know, he's kitted out to be smarter and better than all the rest of them. And he ends up having a kind of, you know, papa role with respect to everybody else. And he's obviously really attractive and everybody really likes him. But you know, they're not all going there at once to see God. They variantly want a closeness with God. They have a certain closeness of shared information. You know, because God's communicating to everybody directly. But seeing him is a whole other story. Christ showed himself as an angel. That was the kind of body he took on in those days. But access to him was... Satan, and what we call him Satan, but his name was Halo then. Okay, so that association you have to call high, fast, intimate, the whole bit. Okay, but he somehow got it in his head that that association was not to his liking. There was something in the divergence, as I said before, between him and the creatures and God and him that just rankled too much. In other words, he's the example of being in total close proximity every day, but the thinking stopped being shared. God was pouring himself into Halal, and Halal kept... I mean, even Halel is a title, but I don't know what his name was. It, God kept pouring himself into Halel, and for a while it was enjoyment between the two. And at some point, Halel just it couldn't, just didn't. It started to feel bad to him for whatever is, you know, I told you it was an inferiority complex. It, the whole question of him being inferior started to rankle. God wasn't doing anything different. It just, he started to become more and more aware, started to become more and more understanding about what the story was. And at some point it started to bug him. 
so much so that he reversed his own discomfort and blamed it on God, the Son. And then did his famous thing, I will make myself like the Most High, in Isaiah 14. That was all pre-human. See, we're talking about Old Testament versus New Testament. But before we can even get into that, we got to go back to the beginning. And the beginning was total intimacy. Especially between God and Halal. And then he used the go-between for everybody else. Who also had a certain amount of direct intimacy with God. But not like he did. So he was closest. And he fell first. And he had a lot of admirers. As you can imagine. God would have made him to be, you know, super attractive. For the sake of the angels. If your superior is attractive to you, you enjoy being inferior. It also rankles. And there's always this tension between the two. That happened to him. That happened to the other angels too. Okay, well, when it started to rankle him, he's still attracted to God, but he's bothered by this thing. He finally decides that God is bad in order to make him feel good about himself. That's the test. I already covered that. And he fell. And a third of the angels went with him. So they opted for a covenant of association to be zero. Or to be different from the covenant that ended up getting established first as rules and then as practice between God and the angels. They opted for something else and they wanted all the angelic creation to go with them. So they had a civil war. That's all happening between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Earth was where the, the headquarters was. And that's the story that's actually told in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Satan based himself here. That's also told sort of slyly in Isaiah 45. When Christ says as Theophany, I didn't make it tohu wabohu. I didn't make it as messed up as it became. So therefore you know that all the six day initial creation garbage, misreading of Genesis 1, is completely shot down. See? False doctrines always shut down when you don't compare it with the rest of the Bible. Point being, in Isaiah 45, is that Isaiah is setting up a parallel between Christ and Cyrus. Even as he's setting up the, he's explaining that the trial, the angelic trial, is between Christ and Satan. Satan thinking himself as the first savior of the angels because God must be bad therefore rebels, therefore civil war, therefore tohu wabohu. Chaos and wasteland is how you translate that. For the planet Earth where he set up his headquarters. But two-thirds of the angels didn't go with that. They opted for the relationship with God over what Satan said should be what what God designed. Satan's rebelling against God's design. He's saying truth ought to be shaved instead of truth be free. That's his sort of like juridical messiahship angle. That God is fundamentally unloving and unfair because he invents truth be free. Wrong design. That's Satan's big claim. So Satan's arguing for a different covenant. It's real important to understand what's going to follow. Satan's arguing for a different covenant than the one God inaugurated for the angels that's why they had a civil war that's why two thirds of the angels opted for God's truth be free plan that's why they're called elect angels two sides they elected God God elects them and the other demons the remaining one third elects Satan as the ruler that Satan's plan is better. You've got to understand that to understand why man was created in the first place. I mean, if 
from and this is something of a speculation. It looks to me like the whole plan of creating man was going to be there anyhow, but it was mainly for the purpose of teaching all the angels how to understand that God is not upset about them being inferior to him. All right? I mean, because that's exactly what he told Adam. Adam ruled the animals. The animals are inferior to Adam. Adam would thus learn the parenting pleasure of ruling something less than him so he wouldn't have to be intimidated by God being God. So it only stands to reason to sort of ratchet that up, extrapolate that back to the angels, and that's why humans would have been created anyway. As it turned out, because Satan rebelled, humans were created now, given the facts on the ground, to prove to Satan why Satan's idea is wrong. I mean, God obviously had demonstrated during the war anyway, and, you know, that all had to play out. But it's only playing out to the angels. It's not playing out to a lower creation. So Satan's points are still, in a way, not completely answered, which, of course, God foreknew. Satan's point is that truth should be shaped in the name of reducing suffering. And this would especially be relevant if man was going to be created anyway as a lower creature for the angels to learn parenting and why truth be free is better. But there was no mankind yet to play out this alleged future proof that God was supposed to provide. Where is it? Where is mankind? Now that's all a deduction on my part. And you have to evaluate before God and let me know if you come up with something else. But the Bible does flatly say that man is created to resolve the trial with the angels. That much we know for sure. It's just a question of how did it get that way. It does say that there was a rebellion. It does say that it was prehistoric. It does say that earth was Satan's headquarters. It does say that Satan and company trashed up the universe and put the lights out, and that's why the Holy Spirit is there in Genesis 1-2, restoring the earth. That's all Bible. It's just a question of how it got that way. And I just gave you my speculation on it. So, now man's here. Now there's this Adam person who's lower than the angels. That's Hebrews 12-2. Hebrews 2. Now man finally exists lower than angels. Man also gets a whole set of creation that's also lower than man. So that's parallel to Satan with the angels being below him to rule. Now angels had a lot of other angels for companionship. Adam didn't have anybody. And God let that go on for God knows how long. And naming all the animals. But none of them are like Adam. I have no idea how long that happened. That's one big reason you can't say how old the earth is. How long did that go on? I mean, how many animals are there? How long does it take to name them? How long does it take to walk the planet? And learn it. Because Adam didn't have in his head immediately all the same information the animal, the angels did. Adam's a lower creature. You can't See, this is where we get into communication again. The difference in the nature of the person is lower, so the communication is less. Adam, too, like the angels, was created perfect and adult at birth, which was God creating him from the ground, making a soul in him. Immediately, there's a library in his head, too, but it's smaller than the angels, and there's only one of him. So there are restrictions on communication. There's restriction in his ability to think. There's a restriction in communication. There's a restriction and a difference in thinking style, being style, viewpoint. Because it's all new, so it's not even developed yet. So in that sense, he's like a baby. He, he's got all this information, but he's not even looked at it yet. He's brand new, so is it. And there's this person named God who was visible in some format because he visits Adam every day in the garden. 
Okay, but he's visiting him once a day, every day in the garden. And of course, there's a thought communication going on even when that doesn't happen. But the physicality of it is, is an important dimension, and it's limited. And you can tell by the way God talks to him that it's limited. He's not exactly a child, and we're not told everything that went on between them. But it's really not like it was with the angels. It's a lot more restricted. Now that imposes a kind of distance. God is far more superior to lower man than God's superiority to angels. There's only one of him, so he's alone. Everybody else is way lower than him, and they're animals, actually. And they're really nice, and they're really cute, and God basically provides all their food for them, and Adam just plays with them all day and names them. But, you know, it was long. There's nobody that's just like him. And the only one who he can even talk to is way superior to him. So there's a tension. And there's a very limited covenant too. You eat from this tree, you die. That's it. I knew a lot. There were a lot of conversations, obviously, every day. But, and I'm sure he knew about the angels. I'm sure he knew about the trial. <clears throat> and I would even venture to say that he knew about, you know, the fact that he was on trial. Did he know that God was going to make Another human? I don't know. But, as you can see, there is some kind of association going on. There is a kind of covenant going on. He's aware of other beings. Whether he can see them or not, I don't know. It seems to be taken as a given, but... You know, I don't know. So we see a huge difference in the cost, in the covenant of association based on the size of the persons, the way the communication is done, the amount of the communication, the amount of the understanding. You're with me on that. Sorry this is taking so long, but you know, I haven't seen anybody else explain this. So I'm trying. All right. So the covenant of association with Adam was obviously smaller. Now notice a lot of things that aren't there that we have today. You don't have rituals. You don't have potlucks and what do you want to call it? Giving to charity good deeds is what you don't have. Actually, there's nothing about good deeds. There's also, you know, no sacrifice. There's one issue that's a prohibition. Nothing else. So you have to call that covenant kind of limited. At the same time, one thing you can be real sure of is that the relationship doesn't have anything to do with good deeds. And I'll pick up more on that in the next increment.